Hello, everybody. My name is Oliver Lash, and I'm the author of the textbook Principles of Management, Practicing Ethics, Responsibility, and Sustainability. And this is a quick presentation of the topic of deciding the mode of management of deciding ethically, responsibly, sustainably. And uh, this presentation is dedicated to the uh, colleagues and uh, the students at Uppsala University, particularly the ones studying um, tourism industry and entrepreneurship in the tourism industry in a sustainable way. So many of the examples that I will give throughout this presentation will be about exactly this, will be about tourism, about sustainability and tourism management more broadly. So let's have a look at how that goes. Good, here we are. So that's the book. If uh, you wanna have a closer look, um, this is chapter eight on deciding. So all of the examples and all the different frameworks are in here. So what are the learning goals of that session really and of that chapter? We will uh, only address some of them, but uh, all of them will uh, be in, in the main uh, book chapter, of course. So the idea is that we are trying to find out how to decide ethically, responsibly and sustainably and actually doing so in a whole person approach. And whole person here means we're not only deciding with our heads quite rationally, well, usually the head does more than being rational, but um, that's what is typically associated is, uh, so associated with. We also do decide intuitively, creatively, and relationally, but it's deciding together with other people. And we're trying to avoid uh, certain decision-making errors that are very common based on those different ways of making decisions. And uh, a very interesting fact is actually that 20% of executives in a global survey say that they have excellent decision-making practices, while a majority say much of the time they devote to decision-making is used ineffectively. So there seems to be an opportunity for improvement there, which is quite so considerable. So here, a, a first example. This is the company uh, Yashpaka um, uh, in, uh, in India. Um, Ved Krishna, the, uh, the former CEO of the company, whom you actually see, I think, in the back here in front of the blue, um, the blue wall, um, he, he has uh, had such a large variety of very difficult and interesting decisions to make, which we will have a quick look at and we see how that actually is not all uh, uh, not all rational decision making, but also does involve other modes of decision making and they come together in making a good decision. Um, so uh, Vitz's uh, fa uh, father, KK uh, Junjunwala, who used to be the, the CEO of, of Yash, Yashpaka at some point in time, a very, very personal level took the decision to uh, tour the world with a motorcycle. So that's when, um, that's part of, 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 of how Vid actually uh, became to be one of the main decision makers of that company. Um, but then, so, so that's obviously, it that doesn't sound like a very rational decision if you want so. Um, but then also, um, he, as, as uh, being the, the figurehead of that company and the company very much being a, uh, an enterprise in, uh, in, in the growth mode at this point of time, so that's where the connection to entrepreneurship comes in, um, he actually decided to move away from uh, traditional paper packaging, which is what they were doing in the beginning, towards um, biomimetic paper packaging. So uh, paper packaging that... Um, is designed by nature's principles, so by learning from nature. So very concretely to uh, do biodegradable paper, paper packaging, which actually um, would decompose in natural conditions. So this is quite big. This is um, also a decision as we often have in entrepreneurship, which is not necessarily just going the normal path forward. So uh, rationally you would say, well, let's build now existing competences in standard paper. Uh, let's explore and exploit that market uh, very actively. Let's become a market leader there. No, we're going somewhere else, laterally, lateral thinking. That's what you often to refer in creative decision-making. Um, so, but then also uh, Beth reports in, in the case that we have in the, in, in the chapter uh, about a pers uh, personal decisions uh, among others himself being burned out and making that, that personal decision of uh, moving on to a different position in the company, his own company, become the head of strategy um, based on that intuition that he wanted to go somewhere else. So it, uh, it's a very interesting case. And I think it highlights some of the 
the decision making examples and different modes of decision making also because it is relational decision making that the, that they're doing there very very strongly um, there's a fascinating history of how this uh, uh, Indian company in a very hierarchical society started to engage in democratic decision making and no hierarchy or very low low hierarchy management uh, practice where decisions as you see in the photo up there are being taken together um, and at the same time also rationally trying to um, go back as you see in the other picture to uh, very concrete facts and figures and to try to use those figures to arrive at a rational decision for instance about production planning so it is a mixture of all of those different modes of decision making and this is really what this session is about and as herbert simon one <clears throat> of the, uh, the, the very uh, uh, early and, and, and most important uh, theorists on management organization theory said, well, decision making is at the heart of administration, at the heart of management, the logic and psychology of human choice. This is what managers so, so strongly have to rely on. So we better get different modes of decision making going so that we are able to make better decisions in many different dimensions, not only rationally. Um, so I call this the deciding mode of management. When we are managing, when we're engaging into the practice of manage, we do swap, switch between different modes all the time. Now we are in the deciding mode. Now we are in the localizing mode, navigating the global and the local. Now we are in the organizing mode. Uh, now we're in the communicating mode and so on. Um, and the idea is that decision making then, if this is such an integral part of uh, the managerial job and the practice of managing to engage in that decision or deciding mode, um, we also need to have a holistic perspective, whole person decision making perspective, which involves all four of them and more rational, intuitive, creative and relational decision making practices. And then, because we're talking about a uh, uh, ethics, responsibility, sustainability, which we cannot separate out from any job nowadays because of the mess that we are in, um, well, then it needs to be some kind of professional decision making. And with professional in the context of this book, I mean decision making that serves a positive role in society. So just as firefighters, just as architects, just as doctors, um, just as lawyers. So all, all of these do uh, realize a certain positive role in society, just as management can do. Um, and at the same time, to engage into the practice of management with professional conduct. And once again, uh, doing management ethically, responsibly, sustainably. That's what we mean with professional conduct. So uh, here's an actual decision-making situation. And this is very much from a, a travel and possibly tourism background. And it's a true story that happened to myself. So when it says up here, um, imagine you are the customer service counter man uh, imagine you are the customer service counter manager of China Eastern at the local Chinese airport of Ningbo. While well, the customer that you're facing, that's actually me. That really happened to me. I was very, very angry. Um, so I have a valid ticket here. Uh, I've booked it through another partner airline. I think it was Air France back then. Um, and uh, there's a, an issue with software integration. So my ticket doesn't pop up on uh, uh, China Eastern software. So this, this is odd, this can't be. So I, I walked to the counter, they said, sorry, don't have a ticket for you. I walked to the other counter where they're supposed to be able to help me. And they say, no, sorry, we don't have a ticket for you. Um, but they say, yeah, probably it's a software integration uh, uh, error because they could see my printed out ticket and they could see my, my email confirmation that the ticket was there and was paid and everything. Um, so, but now how, what, what do we do? How do we evaluate a decision like that? So the very basic parameters of a decision are immensely important in how we engage with a decision. So let's go step by step. So first of all, it's an unprogrammed decision. So to that particular person, according to her statement, that had never happened before to her. So it's an unprogrammed decision, one that happens uh, uh, infrequently or that uh, that is new. Um, and then the question is also, what, what kind of logic can we base our decision on? Um, so wouldn't it be a fair thing to um, just reissue me a ticket because I paid for it anyway and to let me on the flight and because there is an empty seat with not with my name on it, but the very seat number I have on my my, my online reservation uh, is empty, as I noticed later on when I went onto the flight. Um, so there's a logic of appropriateness of of giving me rebooking me that flight and getting me onto it um, out of fairness. And then there's also a logic of consequences. This is well, uh, you cannot print the boarding pass, which in turn implies the customer uh, will miss his flight. 
So there's a certain diet. So if you cannot print the boarding pass, I will miss my flight. Um, so the logic of consequence is quite a strong one, particularly uh, because the flight actually was related to um, a, a really, really important meeting that I was, that I was having. So there are quite dire consequences. Um, but the problem is the flight leaves in just 45 minutes because we already lost over an hour and a half in trying to figure out how to, to get to the right person to talk to. So the urgency is really, really high. Um, then there's a certain uh, there's a certainty. So if uh, I would have uh, not gotten onto that flight to Shanghai, I would have missed my flight to Copenhagen once again. So this is that's a definite certainty. This will happen if I do not take the decision, uh, if I do not make the decision to uh, uh, to give that customer a new new uh, boarding pass and ticket. Um, so, but then there's also uncertainty because you're not quite sure how your superiors will react. Um, and uh, if, if you just issue another ticket without receiving payment for it, maybe that uh, has some personal consequences for you. So what happened? What do you think? I give you a five second, seconds to, to think about what uh, decision you would have taken. And then I will tell you what decision that person actually took. Would you print a new ticket for me or would you not? Bam, there we are. So uh, what happened was that uh, even after a long, long, long discussion and all kinds of uh, uh, kind of vague threats from, from my side, which I'm not very proud of, for, uh, uh, very, very uh, openly I can say that, um, the, uh, the decision was to not print a new ticket for me, but I was very kindly offered the opportunity to buy a new ticket. So I paid my ticket once again. Um, and uh, got on the flight and uh, funny enough I was sitting in the same row where there was an empty, empty seat with uh, which corresponded to exactly the ticket I had previously bought yeah isn't that fun and uh, uh, just to, to, to bring that story to an end I actually um, then once again reached out to, uh, to, to Air France where I had originally booked my flight and they said well that's the problem of the people at uh, um, at China Eastern, so we can't do anything for you. So why don't you talk to them again? I talked to them again, again and they said, well, that's the problem of uh, Air France. So just venting a little bit of my frustration there. Uh, if anybody's listening from Air France or, or China Eastern, please do something about it. It's a really nasty thing. Good, but the larger learning there is really that um, there are those different decision parameters and uh, this choice situation uh, uh, that we have here, choice situation two, is actually the uh, the decision that we uh, that sorry number number one is the the decision sorry number two is the decision the blue one that we just talked about. So it's a a, a medium programmed unprogrammed decision because it is something that um, is happening for the first time to that person, but because there's this problem in in the system, it's something that is likely to happen more frequently. Um, it is certainty in terms of the consequence of missing the flight. It is urgent because there's just 45 minutes left and uh, there's a very strong logic of uh, appropriateness. Although probably we should move that uh, last one a little bit further to, um, to the left as well because there's also logic of consequence in terms of, this, uh, in terms of the supervisors. So um, what do we do, do with that? So the idea is that different decisions cannot be, uh, be taken in the same way because the decision parameters are very, very different and it helps to reflect on what are actually the characteristics, the parameters of that particular decision. So what we will do now is to think about how can we actually um, how can we actually know those different modes of decision making, uh, rational, intuitive, creative, and relational in a somewhat better way in order to distinguish between them, to be competent in them, and to understand how they can help us to make ethical, responsible, and sustainable decisions um, as a manager, as an entrepreneur, as somebody working in tourism. Uh, Swedish example, great, Luck, lucky me, um, because Uppsala, uh, uh, people of Zala might have a, a relationship and might even know that example, which would be great to discuss later on when I come into your lecture. Um, so uh, really great example. First carbon, uh, carbon neutral climate, uh, well, actually carbon uh, uh, regenerative carbon burger, climate positive burger at Max in Sweden. I want to say it already happened quite a long time ago from, uh, uh, from memory, but how do you actually, what does it, how do you take the decision of what you put into, into those burgers? How do you make purchasing decisions 
if you are purchasing for this burger? How do you sell this burger even? How do you package it and so on? So every decision there is done in a rational way because you've got this one metric that you need to arrive at, which is zero or negative carbon impact. With negative, I mean restorative impact. So it's actually taking carbon out of the atmosphere. So how do you to do a decision like that? Uh, here's an, uh, um, oh, sorry, that, that actually moved to the wrong, wrong place. We're gonna get there just in a moment. Um, so here we go. How, how do we uh, do a decision like this? Um, so one, one way, typical way of doing making rational decisions, if you do it in a more, more formalized way, would be a, a decision tree where you're looking at the different uh, scenarios, the different outcomes, depending on what decision you make, and you look at the likelihoods of those outcomes occurring. So, uh, and then you have, a, have an equation which gives you the overall likelihood, uh, uh, the overall value of each of the different endpoints of your uh, each of the different uh, uh, decisions you could make. In this case, it was a uh, decision about a of a supermarket to add doors or to not add doors uh, to their refrigerators. And the uh, the positive uh, of adding doors, obviously, is you, re re you reduce the carbon impacts very, very considerably. Uh, the negative of adding doors, of course, is uh, well, they said you make it so much more difficult for customers to grab stuff and buy stuff. So using, you're losing sales. So there's an economic and environmental value that we have to attribute to those decisions. And depending on what the final value is, well, you, you choose the one that's overall up. and the environmental impact is. So that's a good example here. And uh, you could imagine something similar to be have been done with uh, the burger and different choices you make in terms of like that of Dubai in a, in, a, uh, in a city that is not exactly known for its leadership in uh, environmental sustainability, but rather rather known for being part of uh, a, 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 a region that's known for um, uh, fossil fuel production, although Dubai itself isn't very strong in, in terms of fossil fuels. But again, so the context here is one where rationally you wouldn't have said, okay, I make a decision to build a city like this here, but intuitively, that person thought, okay, this is something we can do. And because it was an, an out of the box creative type of decision, this is what uh, uh, that, that came out of that intuition it was actually quite successful. And the intuition was right in a way because it did work against all odds. Um, and there's different, many different sources of intuition that we can tap into. So it could be your effect, your feelings or emotions. This gentleman might love Dubai or there was a certain place uh, or a certain event in his life where he thought, okay, so I really need to care about sustainability. I wanna do it at home where I'm from. It must be, might be values-based, for instance, ethical values of his culture. There might be certain past experience. And I, I think he mentioned visiting another sustainable city somewhere uh, in, uh, I think in the US, uh, if I remember correctly, and being inspired by it, want to do something very similar. Um, then there might be also what we call tacit co cognition. So tacit in the sense that it's not explicit reasoning, but you're, you're, you're uh, kind of mulling it over in your head and without being able to trace all of the different steps, you're arriving at a good decision, um, which goes together with the, the sub subconscious mental processing as well. Um, so the, the, all of these are sources of... Um, of intuition which are tacit which uh, uh, and subconscious um, and related to feelings and related to, to past experiences and to values all of those are not very easy measurable um, they're not really easy really easy to um, um, to, to, to provide evidence for so automatically intuitive decisions because of that become a little bit more attackable than rational decisions because typically by ra with rational decisions you have a certain trace of how you arrive there within which, which uh, with intuition uh, the only thing you can say is I just trust my gut I just felt it was the right thing to do and here's a really really good, good framework that I like a lot I, I believe from Harvard Business Review um, about about uh, different things, practices you can engage in in order to strengthen your intuition. Because often we do have the intuitive skills 
being hidden so in the closet so if uh, uh, so to say as the first one point says here um so how do we get there this is the big question and if you try those things well you might actually well be able to to untap to open up your intuition yourself um and then we do have uh, creative decision making so imagine your brew dog brew dog is a uh, um, a uk based i believe a scottish uh, brewery uh, and a brewery chain outlet um, and they actually decided to during the, the time of the pandemic very very early on to uh, add alcohol-based hand sanitizer to their products so this is not what you typically would think of if you're thinking of a brewery or an alcoholic beverage company or uh, of a, a kind of pub and restaurants uh, out outlets company um, so it's a creative decision. It's a lateral thinking. It goes. It's thinking outside the box that they made here. Um, so how do you do that? Well, uh, typically what you have is that um, the creative uh, creative decision making process uh, starts from a problem, and uh, you do have a certain divergence of ideas. So you start to um, end up with many, 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 many different options and as many as possible, possibly, and as far out of the box as possible. But then at some point in time, you start converging again and finding it to uh, become a solution to something. Um, well, the problem I would say in the Brudock example probably was, well, um, now our production facilities are slowing down because our outlets have to close because of the pandemic. So what do we do? We've got a skilled workforce who are really good at, uh, at running restaurants and, uh, and producing beer. Um, so what do we do with those people? How do we keep them busy? Well, uh, what do we need here? And there's the solution to a pro uh, to this problem and to another problem, well, there's a shortage of hand sanitizer. I still remember when I walked into a, uh, a pharmacy in, in, in Sheffield, I was told I was only allowed to take one bottle of hand sanitizer because they had to ration it to one per person. Imagine that. Um, so that, that's the way uh, solve your own problem and at the same time provide find a solution for even other problems. And that's because you did not from the very beginning um, think in a managerial way towards, okay, so what, what is my performance? What is the one problem? And here's the thing that I've got and I'm moving towards that. No, you actually move away from that very linear way first and open up all of the opportunities. Uh, and actually one more thing that Brudock did uh, uh, based on, this, on the same problem, what do we do with the venues? We're paying rent for it. Um, all of those restaurants, and they actually volunteered to make them uh, uh, vaccination and testing centers during the early days of the pandemic. So once again, um, solution to one problem also being solution to another problem and a very creative way of using what you've got. Uh, and then another really interesting example, which I, which I like a lot, is uh, about how do you actually how are you able to, to be inclusive in decision making on the one hand, to make sure that everybody's voice is heard and considered in the decision that affects them, particularly when it comes to stakeholders of that decision, people who somehow have a relationship to it, who are affected by or, uh, um, or, who, or who, who, uh, whom you are interested in or who are interested in, in your decision, because there's some relationship mutually affecting each other. Um, so how can we how can we do that? And uh, one thing that I find particularly helpful there is this model here, which is a continuum of different uh, types of stakeholder engagement in decision making. So it more walks, uh, moves all the way from telling where the one actor who, who has the, the formal decision making power or the, the, the um, if you want to, the, the button in his hand where um, it's a yes or no, just tells others, this is my decision. Um, and then we've got on the other opposite extreme democratizing. So everybody's being included in the decision making with an equal voice. And of course that, um, that uh, those, those different positions on that continuum uh, imply different degrees of authority transferred either to the, the actor or the stakeholders. And that decision making framework comes from the context um, of uh, contingency in, in, in leadership. So contingency in the sense of different situations. So depending on the situation and depending on how capable your stakeholders are, how salient your stakeholders are, how capable you are as a decision maker, how much urgency there is and so on. So all of the things we talked before about the, the decision-making setting come into play once again, trying to find out what kind of decision-making should we apply in that particular situation.
Good. So this is already what I, what I wanted to talk about, but uh, this was only a part of the chapter. And I want to I want to give you a quick overview of what else is in there. Um, so first of all, I very quickly went over that one up here. So there's much much more detail on those different modes of decision making if you're interested in. And also very importantly down here was we have the different downsides. So for instance, bounded rationality that human beings are actually not very good at being rational or group think when it comes to relational decision making. And uh, also methods on how you can actually use those decision-making processes um, or practices, very similar to uh, the decision trees, for instance, that we've seen already. Good, but what else is in there beyond those different modes of decision-making? So we already said um, there's, there's also different types of decision-making processes. There are uh, decision-making processes where you can go linear from problem to path to solution. There are certain trial and error decision-making modes where the context is a little bit more tricky and so on. There's the garbage can decision model, which is fascinating in an organization that actually, uh, where, where it becomes a, a coincidence that a decision is being taken just because the right actors, the right resources and the right context were in the same place at the same time. So decision-making processes are not all equal. And this is a really, really interesting um, thing to look at what kind of pros of process of decision actually works in or is at play in my particular decision situation. Um, so and then we we also have um, the the idea in there that um, each of as mentioned each of those decision making activities actually or, or modes might have uh, different problems as well. And this is exactly why we have to use them in a flexible way and knowing when to use which and when to not use which and also knowing how to actually counteract um, those problems. And then there's more material in the chapter like this really fascinating interview with uh, Roy Sadeby who talks about um, that, that myth of economic rationality. So we're always told in business and, and management and entrepreneurship, well, you have to be, you have to make rational decisions, get the, the market intelligence, as many numbers as possible and get great software to make decisions for you. Um, and he actually talks about how that's just a myth. And the second one, um, the, the first, uh, Roy is, is, is an academic, very, very uh, distinguished academic. The, the second one is a practitioner, uh, Tommy Ware out of, uh, out of Cambridge. Uh, Cambridge, USA, um, at the uh, ed educated at the MIT, um, and he uh, is the CEO of a company that actually has a software that's meant to help make managers rational decisions. So very, very interesting uh, interview there, there as well. So it's a way of counteracting that bounded rationality which we mentioned just before. And then we've got a very interesting, uh, real example of a, an episode, a story, which is anonymized because it's a very juicy, sometimes a little bit too juicy story um, about how complex it actually is to make those kind of decisions when you are in a situation like that. And then we also have those worksheets in all of the chapters which are about um, uh, helping you to, to carry out certain managerial practices. And here the idea is to actually think about a concrete decision and think about its effectiveness in solving uh, what you're trying to solve in uh, the type of moral value of that option that you're thinking about, the stakeholder value for all the ones involved and the triple bottom line impact as well. So if you're in tourism management and uh, you're thinking about different, uh, like, like big decisions, like different business models, or if you're thinking about small decisions like what do I put on the menu today? Uh, and what is this carbon impact, such as what we've seen in, in the, the example of that burger? You can use a matrix like that in order to evaluate the different alternatives. Uh, and just one more example, the, uh, the, the fishbone uh, uh, worksheet to analyze problems, to dissect them quite, uh, quite literally is very helpful. So what we've seen, there is, it's such an immensely interesting, but also rich and complex field that we are, we are, we are venturing into if we're talking about deciding in the managerial or business or, or entrepreneurial context. Um, and we only could, ha could have had a look, uh, look at a couple of them. So have a closer look. Um, all of the, uh, the things that you see in, uh, in that book And that also uh, the book is something that's being considered currently in your uh, in your program uh, for potential adoption. So you might hear, hear more about that. But if uh, you don't uh, uh, get it through your program, have a look at it. Um, there's a fairly complete version since yesterday on Google Books, which you can look at as well. Um, and also there's a channel for the book, which uh, this, this video is posted on, which has one video for 
uh, each of the chapters. So you can have a look at the other chapters as well, particularly if you're in the tourism and uh, uh, sustainability context, um, I would recommend you the, uh, uh, first of all, the localizing chapter because it uh, brings that, so another mode of management between local and global, which I think is so essential to tourism. Um, but also the sustainability chapter is, uh, I, I think, really rich and uh, is something that you could use very well, in, including uh, my favorite example for a restorative business is actually a, uh, a lodge in, uh, in the Peruvian Amazon, so very much tourism and uh, destination based, as I understand your, your master program is. Good. Uh, if you want to see more, subscribe to the channel, um, leave a comment here so that I can comment back or also add me on LinkedIn, um, oliver.lash. Uh, you will find me quite easily, I, I believe. And I'm very much looking forward if you are somebody who is in the class at Uppsala University to have a really good discussion with you just now.